that is over, I fear there will be little left of our world. You read your books about UFOs and Roswell and whacked out theories and government conspiracies. I think that you want to believe. What makes you trust them? I don't know. I'm a good judge of character. This is on planet radio. Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is our planet radio. Good evening and welcome. It's live, Jim, but not as we know it. Not as we know it. Not as we know it. <laughs> Great fun. Always fun. Um, sometimes the suspense makes it all worthwhile. And uh, as usual, technical difficulties beset us because it is the Internet. It's the man's machine and we're just riding it. Welcome to Off Planet Radio Live for the final day of July. 2013. God, I am so glad to see July gone, and apparently the heat with it. Um, hope it's cool where you're at, or hope that you are chilling. If not, looks like the chat room's chilling tonight. <laughs> you guys, you guys are awesome. You sat here and rode this out while we did the white white knuckle ride, trying to get things up. And uh, my guest is with me tonight, Doc Vega. Chris Holly is here as well. And um, those of you on the live stream may notice you got forwarded over to a slightly different web page. It is actually uh, part of the new website. We moved the streaming operations there over the weekend because it's a better server with much better uh, response time. So this is leg one of what will eventually be the new website. Next week, Ken Pfeiffer will be joining us from U World UFO Photos and News dot org. And he's going to bring us up to date with the visual sightings around the planet. August 14th, Richard Pam Nassano of the Searcher Group is going to be here. And uh, we are um, stocking the shelves right now with guests throughout the month of August. Schedules will go up <laughs> when I have time. And yes, my guest is here, so no, we don't need to... Um, we don't need to do any of that. Thanks, guys. Uh, Chris Holly is here as well. Good evening, Chris. Welcome. Oh, wait a minute. I don't have you up. There Let's you go. There you are. There I am. Here you are. Yeah. Glad to be here. We Hello just, uh, to everybody out there. Hello, Doc Vega. Good evening, Doc Vega. Hello. Good evening. And we had some massive problems getting connected, but we're good now. Um, everybody's here. Um, <clears throat> Chris, we always... Some type of an extraterrestrial intervention. <laughs> Uh -huh. That wouldn't be the first time, Doc. No. No, <laughs> no actually, I had something like that happen on the last paranormal radio show I was on on the Internet. They had black helicopters hover over their studio. Chris, what did I tell you? I'm waiting for the helicopters to come over. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, Let's not wish for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's happened here more than a few times. Um, yeah, so let, let's just go ahead and launch into it. Um, Doc, you come to us kind of through um, UFO Digest, and I didn't get a chance to really give you a proper int introduction. You describe yourself as a travel traveler through space and time. You are a political commentator, author. Uh, 
you are a columnist for UFO Digest as well as some other periodicals. You've done TV and radio talking about UFOs and a lot of other topics as well. So tell us a little bit about how you got into, I guess we'll call it the fringe, or did you always live in the fringe? Well, um, you know, I, I started out uh, as, as a kid in junior high, you know, in my study hall class reading these amazing UFO, you know, sightings that were going on. And I remember a kid after, you know, after football practice or whatever, you know, getting in the study hall and reading this stuff. And I was going, it's amazing how the media always laughs this off or acts like it doesn't exist, yet we've got generals admitting to the you know reality of of ufos so i was perplexed i was going why do we have this uh you know yin yin and yang you know relationship with reality here when it comes to the official version as opposed to what really is happening by trained observers and the testimonies that are quite impressive and the and the uh type of uh you know, high-ranking brass in the military that swear that, you know, that this is going on. I mean, what is this, a disinformation campaign, or, or do we just have a schism, you know, that, that uh, you know, that results from the government and the uh, government speak, so to, so to say, that uh, comes out of uh, the media, you know, which always parrots the lies of the government, but rarely do we actually get the truth. So, you know, I've you know, I began to raise an eyebrow, and, and uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, there's a lot more to this than most people realize. And, you know, that was kind of my introduction into it. So I guess the question is, and we can ask this between the three of us because we all kind of are cut from the same fabric, what the hell is it that puts us in line with being curious about this? Um, and I know Chris's story because she's told it a number of times, and I have my own stories, and I have my own sense of why I've kind of always been tapped into this. But is there some reason why we talk about this when most of the general public's more worried about um, uh, the, the baseball the latest game? reality show? The latest, yeah, unreality <laughs> show. Yeah. You know, or, or, you know, the latest, you know, ball game or, or the latest, uh, uh, you know, uh, rumors about whatever celebrity's life everybody's supposed to be glued to. You know, uh, all the distractions that take us away from what really means anything in life. Exactly. And yet you seem to, uh, you know, be plugged into this. You were plugged into it as a kid. So was I. I mean, when I was growing up <clears throat> in the 1970s. I was doing research on this. I did a science fair project in eighth grade that actually won a second place award statewide on UFOs at a time when nobody Excellent. was talking about UFOs. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately then we didn't have much. Um, we had Operation Blue Book, uh, which was a dissent foe campaign, but there even then was anecdotal evidence as well. What finally did you conclude was your genetic predisposition towards uh, curiosity of anomalous craft in the sky? Well, let's put it this way. When you're a little kid, about six years old, you're standing on your porch in Los Angeles, California, uh, not too far from uh, uh, Hollywood and Vine, where the stars drive up and down the streets and you can see them all the time. Uh, and you see a an opaque object that looks like a semi-translucent reddish globe that is tumbling through the sky. And before you can yell to your family and your brothers, you know, uh, what you've just seen, it's passed over your house and it's in the distance. I think that's a pretty good introduction into, uh, you know, another reality. Yeah. And I can see it as plainly now in my mind as I saw it as a, as a child. And I was pretty well aware of what was going on at that time because there was a lot of sonic booms and a lot of news, uh, you know, that was going on about experimental aircraft and all the uh, Air Force and rocketry uh, news that was around. So even as a kid, I was really pretty well aware of what goes on in the sky already 
so that I would be able to discern an unusual event from uh, something that was, you know, just mundane and routine or conventional, as you might call it. Now, you recall in a sighting that you had as a child, um, was that the only sighting that you ever had, or did you ha seem to have, um, let's just say, synchronous experiences later on in life? Yes, uh, I have, and uh, also even my, uh, I was a single parent that raised four children, and two of my kids also told me that uh, they had, sight had sight sighted things, you know, that were very, very unusual uh, in the sky, uh, nocturnal sightings. Mm -hmm. How many people do you think have had sightings, and because of their programming, are not able to, well, it's what we call cognitive dissonance. In other words, my suspicion for a long time has been that more people have seen anomalous things, but they simply cannot connect their, their entrained um, frontal vision to process something, so there's like this blockout that occurs. Well, you know, the brain does filter things out unconsciously, and I'll give you an example. Uh, in between 19, uh, 1993 and 96, I was a columnist for the Plano Star Courier, and I uh, was part of investigating a um, an abductee support group. And one of the people there was kind of like a high uh, a high uh, public um, visibility person, so they had to play down their role in the group. Because, you know, being a corporate head and everything, you know, they didn't want to mm -hmm. have their, you know, company say, oh, we're disclaiming this, you know, whatever this individual is involved in, our company has, you know, no knowledge and doesn't support that view. So anyway, this lady was telling me, and she lived in a, in a nice, uh, you know, uh, upper middle class neighborhood that she came out of her house one day, and here is an object in midday hovering across the street. And there's a neighbor out in their yard, you know, like uh, raking, raking leaves or something, completely oblivious to what's going on. And she, here she comes out of her house. It's the first thing she notices in the sky. And like you said, I mean, you know, people are, some people are simply programmed to filter that out of their consciousness. Yeah, one of Chris and I's early conversations had to do with people and specifically abductees, but even people who have experienced sightings, and the fact that even if you're with people in uh, who are with you in an actual event, one of two things happens. They either process it out of their consciousness completely, or they will completely disclaim you and deny they even know you anymore. I mean, this is how much of a stigma there is to this, this, type, of, uh, this type of experience. Well, eventually, that's what happened. My uh, This group, for instance, uh, I've, as a matter of fact, I've seen two UFO-related groups just disintegrate for no good reason other than, you know, for some, you know, unknown reason, something that brought everybody together in the group. Um, uh, There's some kind of uh, uh, an unnecessary or, or uh invisible force that just breaks the group up, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, Right, and, and there's a certain amount of denial here, you know, that occurs when people come to grips with what it is that they've experienced, and then they want to back off, and they don't want to admit it to themselves anymore. Chris, do you have anything? Well, can I just yeah. say something? That, yeah, I also have spent a lot of time with abductees, and I did very well with them. Everything was fine, but I did have to actually sign an agreement that I would protect their identity because they all were had high visual jobs and placements in society and did not want to lose those positions. So I did exactly. do it. Exactly, that's the, group, the point, yes. Yeah, yes. yes, and the group stayed together. However, and I got amazing information from this group, at the end of it, at disgust at how what I was writing about them was being received and that no one showed any interest in wanting to be 
they were looking for a professional university, uh, a professional group of researchers or a university or government agency that was serious to come and talk to them, and they would agree to do that. And since they all had physical um, alterations to themselves, I'm going to put it that way, physical problems from their abductions, they agreed for the first time to be examined. And I could not get anyone to be interested in them. And that, when I went back to them and said, no, I'm, you know, I'm out there, I'm sending out letters, I'm, I'm writing about it, I'm asking for, you know, research companies to please, you know, uh, organizations, I mean, to contact me, and nothing happened. They became so angry and so disillusioned and frustrated that they insisted we break bond, break apart the group, and went our own ways. And, you know, it's really, really sad. So there's all kinds of aspects to this thing and reasons why reliable, good people that have good information and should be listened to get disgusted and walk away. Um, also, I think... Well, I've, I've experienced that myself, yes. Yeah. And I also think that they felt, if we continued together, and it went on, that their abductions might come back, that we may be broken up in a different fashion. And they were afraid that not only they would be taken again, or worse, one of their children or someone in their family. So uh, they were really, really afraid of that also. So it's a very interesting thing. You think, oh, you know, we're going to put all these people together. We're going to get all this information. It's going to be wonderful. It doesn't work out that way. And it's very interesting well, to me what you're telling me. Well, let me give you an example. Um, I was going to do a, a UFO documentary with a producer for Plano Telecable. It was Richardson in Plano Telecable, and uh, so one, you know, we, you know, we set up a, a schedule of, you know, of, of editing events, you know, that, that we were going to use, you know, for the storyboard and everything, you know, for the, uh, you know, everything we we're going to do. And one of them was we had gotten a referral from a Florida policeman who had been. Um, present when a UFO had hovered over a large crowd of people and it had left the area, circled the area and come back and it was, I mean it was like witnessed by so many people so vividly and then the officer when he uh, submitted his report on the incident it was like all of a sudden he just ran into all this official obstruction and um he couldn't understand why, you know, he was running into so many problems over simply doing his job and reporting an observation that included a lot of people. Well, it got so bad that he ended up quitting his job, and uh, apparently he'd gone through a divorce and he had custody of his daughter. So he moved to Irving, Texas, which wasn't a great distance from, you know, Plano, where, you know, we were going to be shooting this documentary. And, uh, the strange thing was is that as we got into the documentary and did our planning and all the areas that we we're going to go to, and I had to contact the U.S. Air Force and ask them if we could do some uh, routine footage at uh, Carswell Air Base, uh, and then we, you know, we had a, a couple of people, official, you know, type trained observers like this policeman and, and another gentleman who was at Whiteman Air Force Base when a UFO landed right in the middle of a strategic air command base. And we got, I got his filmed and written testimony and put it in the newspaper article. And then I was going to carry him over into the documentary. Well, just everything slowly but surely just started falling apart. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like the studios were saying, well, you know, we're going to, we're about to be purchased by a new owner and you're not going to have access to the <laughs> film studio anymore. And I'm going, wait a minute now, wouldn't this new owner be interested, you know, in a, you know, in, in a, in a film project like this? But, you know, it was just like, nobody all of a sudden wanted any part of it, you know, and this poor uh, officer first, you know, is like, you know, he was all, you know, like, uh, 
you know, willing to do the, the project and everything and, and give us an interview, which I thought would have been really good. And then all of a sudden he got paranoid and backed off and he said that it might not be good for his life. Is and I'm going, well, I, I said, I can just, I can just give you an interview. There doesn't, doesn't need to be a visual. Okay. I mean, you know, and he just, you know, he just got paranoid and just backed off. And, uh, you know, apparently for some people it takes a lot of courage to do this, you know, because they're going to go through official denial or, you know, people are going to raise their eyebrows at them and say, hmm, you're not from around here, are you, pal? You know, or whatever, you know, connotation. <laughs> you're not one of well, us, you are you, huh? You're going to get, hmm? get attacked if you, you talk yeah, about Yeah, you're going to get ridiculed, exactly, yeah. And there's, you, I you guess it's just be, the unfortunate, you know. You know yeah, just yeah. A, just an unfortunate, you know, implication of the of this manifestation, you know. Yeah. Oh, and it's very interesting to me that the people that stick with it have the fortitude <laughs> to do stuff so because they do take. Or I know I have. I'm sure Randy has, and I'm sure you have. You take a beating from people, and again, they they either um, want to use you, it seems, the, the information, or abuse you because you're giving the information. It depends on what group you're, you know, talking with. Uh, it, the abuse also is out there because a lot of these people need to be protected. They have jobs, families, and communities they live in, and I really don't know why you need their, you know, name, telephone, and address in order to get what happened to them out there. I'm more interested in what the event was and how they survived it. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's why they talked to me, and I refuse to, to give out their information. But, um, you know, it, it, it's a difficult subject matter. And I, I, I really, to this day, don't understand why people are so afraid of it. Well, we've come a long way. There's no doubt about it. I mean, think of what the people in the 1940s and 50s had to go through. Uh, I've heard of people being run out of their homes, you know, out of their towns because, you know, they, they you know, they, they reported a sighting that they saw. And then because of all the, uh, you know, the uh, attention they got from the press, you know, coming into some small town and, everything, all of a sudden the people, you know, just, I mean, literally just force this person to have to leave, and uh, they end up being like a marked man for the rest of their life or something. I, I don't see how a lot of people had the courage, you know, back in the 50s and the early 60s and, and even in the late 40s to actually admit, you know, to what they were seeing because they were really labeled as being wackos, you know, on the on the lunatic fringe. Yeah, and we don't need to look much further than probably... Uh, I think today we're very fortunate, you know. Um, there still is the subtle ridicule, you know, and, and unfortunately there's also the government influence, you know. In other words, the, the, the rise of the, um, of the security state, the police state, um, you know, there is a subtle uh, uh, air of suppression, you know, that people have to consider there. Um, especially if they're in the military or, 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 or a police officer or somebody that's in some official capacity. But for a normal uh, civilian citizen, generally things are a little easier, I think, you know, today than they used to be for people. So you've been writing and reporting. What do you think, Randy? Well, oh, you're not hearing me. That's why I was muted out. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> Actually, the audience was hearing me. You weren't hearing me because I muted. Never mind. Um, it's a ridiculous situation. We have so much recorded information. And when you, you guys were talking, I was thinking about um, just the evidence that was put out, for instance, by Leslie Keene in her book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials, and the official record that she established there. We have reams of information both on the record and off the record and yet there's been an official policy since the late 1950s that the media would not touch this subject and it's, it was officially taboo which is what everybody who tackles this at any level above 
uh, well, apparently even community level TV, you simply can't go there. And yet at the same time, <clears throat> you think back to the 1970s and you look at the movies that started coming out, uh, Close Encounters being one of the earliest, but there were some other films as well. And we're almost like a schizophrenic society. On the one hand, we entertain these ideas in terms of fiction, which is beginning to look more and more like real fact. It's almost like they're merging. And yet at the same time, our so-called major media will not touch this story except if they can do it with a smirk and a grin and a wink. Right. Hey, Randy, do you remember the words of Noel Coward? He said life, uh, he said, Something about entertainment doesn't necessarily reflect life, but life reflects entertainment. entertainment. You know, so, you know, there are some people that are convinced that the UFO sightings that, you know, manifested themselves in the population in the 70s and 80s or whatever may be the byproduct of, uh, you know, human psyche that's experienced these, uh, these B movies that came out, these sci-fi movies that you know that came out during the 50s you know so now it's been melded into the consciousness of people and they're and they're starting to manifest you know illusions or mirages or whatever i don't buy it but you know there's no doubt that you know pop culture and real life bounce back off of each other you know uh when you think of uh war of the world you know and what happened in 1938 with orson welles radio program and how that created a mass hysteric panic and then we come to find about decades later that it was an actual social experiment mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. and yet people were killed you know i mean it, it so you know you, you kind of wonder to a certain degree you know if you know, there's a certain amount of government disinformation or manipulation involved in this whole, you know, in this whole twisted equation that we're trying to figure out. Well, on the other hand, and I guess this brings us into the first area that I, I really wanted to win with you, Doc. Um, I mark 1947 as the beginning of the UFO era. Now, I come at that from Roswell. And at the same time, I've always considered Roswell to be kind of problematic. Um, I've heard of an array of opinions about Roswell, and really, um, I've never been comfortable, but for some reason, that's the demarcation line. 1947 mm-hmm. appears to be the spring bed from which we launched into this whole sequence of events. And I cannot be convinced otherwise that regardless of what happened at Roswell, the sightings that we have had reported in a steady stream, and in some cases a gusher like we had in the late uh, mid-1960s to the early 1970s, and I'm speaking specifically of my area here in Pennsylvania, we had major flaps. We had major flaps over Washington, D.C. Oh, definitely. Over Los Angeles, over Texas. And these have been recorded and documented, and I don't think you can attribute this to public delusion. Some of the people who I knew who saw the craft back when I was a kid were not subject to delusion. They did not read sci-fi magazine. They were not staying up late at night. Well, you couldn't stay up late at night and watch TV then. And they certainly weren't listening to Coast to Coast. So the problem becomes cause and effect or effect and cause and I think there's a lot of confusion because uh, the confusion's been sewn into this whole meme. So can you share a little bit with us about what Roswell means to you? Because I know you've written about it on UFO Digest and, and I'd like to get your no, take God, on God, I've it. written endlessly about Roswell. I started writing about Roswell in 1993, first of all, and my first take on on my first articles with uh, Plano Star Courier were that the major reason for the suppression of the event was that the status quo, uh, the authoritarian uh, state that existed at that time, in other words, you know what we consider to be normal reality, had been faced with a major requirement of concealment which caused, you know, the, you know, the basic emergence of the security state 
you know, that it wasn't anything mm. compared to what it is now. But, I mean, it, it began. I mean, this, the began National Security in Act in right, yes. Isn't that came interesting? about in 1947. Yeah. And, of course, Rich Dolan's done a lot of research into this, but he's not the first person who got this. I was on radio back in uh, 2003 talking about uh, the National Security Act and all the synchronicities that went on in 1947, being Roswell and the National Security Act and all these strange things that were happening in the world at the same time. And it was like... Why would you need a National Security Act unless you had secrets you really wanted to lock down? Because, yeah, some kind of unprecedented event had to have occurred, you and know, what? that convinced people that there needed to be, I mean, extraordinary measures exercised by the government. Many people have said that that was a reaction. Uh, to uh, the realities of a world post World War II, obviously post nuclear. But, in fact, what most people who have not studied those documents don't know is that was a complete reconfiguration of our country away from what had traditionally been what we call a republic into what we now winkingly call a democracy, which is basically a technocracy that was enabled by all these agencies that were generated off the National Security Council. Mm -hmm. No doubt. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, and really, you can go back as early as 1938, and there are, are all, is already evidence that the government knew something and had already recovered a crash disk. And that uh, there was a Secretary of State in 1938, uh, Cordell Hull, that actually introduced a friend who was a pastor to a deep basement storage area underneath the White House where there were supposedly four entities stored in glass containers in formaldehyde. And that he told this minister, he said, and they were very, very good friends. They grew up together. So he trusted this guy implicitly. Okay. And he said, and there was also a, the recovered vehicle in that same storage room and there is also a former white house uh, employee that that was at work for the government at that time that did testify that uh, at that time there was a large basement storage area that, that she said could have been like an exhibit hall in that time and that um, okay there was this vehicle this this circular vehicle that was there too and anyway what cordell hall told the guy was he said now the reason the government has not revealed this to the people is because it's afraid there would be a massive panic and go to Roswell another nine years later after World War II and here they are again trying to preserve you know the existence of all normal conventional institutions and philosophies and religions in our society because if this comes out, not only will it probably break down people's belief systems, but the government will lose control because the illusion of normality is no longer there. This could create a wide, you know, a huge panic, a breakdown of all, you know, conventional, you know, uh, beliefs and wisdoms. And, uh, of course, the government wants control. And one way that they maintain control, of course is by keeping secrets, you know, to very, very crucial information like this. And yet at the same time, if you go back far enough in history and you begin to look at some of the objects that have been retrieved from Egypt and you begin to study some of those very cryptic um, boss reliefs and, and, and etchings out of Egypt, you notice that there are these very strange beings depicted there that look a whole lot like giants. Like spacemen? And spacemen. And then well, the spacecraft, the, world, yeah. the spacecraft themselves depicted in those same etchings. And you go forward into um, a more modern period where you have all these pictures of Jesus and the Holy Mother and they have 
not just halos around their head, but they have these very strange-looking craft flying in the background. And we're talking about paintings mm -hmm. that go back into the, the 12 and 1300s. So something's been shaken in history for a long time, and it appears as though what we call normal reality is entrained reality that has been programmed into us to keep us from finding out what they consider to be a rather inconvenient truth. Exactly. Exactly. You know, we are, um, unfortunately, I, I would have to say, and I just wrote a couple of articles about this, that we exist in, a, in, in an actual matrix. It may not be an electronic matrix that controls our consciousness, but if you look at the exclusion of, of reality and truth and the screening of, of you know, the type of uh, news events and, and what the White House wants us to think and believe and that, you know, we should, you know, not consider the U.S. Constitution to be, you know, the beacon of light for our freedoms anymore, that uh, the president, you know, thinks that, you know, that uh, the U.S. Constitution is an obstruction to what he wants to do for the people of this country. When you, when you look at the way the news services slant, you know, reporting, and, and we know that's been going on for decades with the UFO problem as well, is that even if they do report a sighting, it's always, uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek. Like, this is kind of a joke, so don't take it too serious. You yeah, know, they, or, they run you know, it on the entertainment you know, segment opinions of the program. Expressed yeah. for those of the UFO nuts on the program, you know. And if you take an add into that, the fact that we are having almost shoved down our throats, definitely the generations after us, all the young people, technology to the point that they are constantly uh, wired into what I'm going to call the grid, the control grid. Mm -hmm. They are constantly being downloaded and controlled by the very forces that you just described. We are being, exactly. I think, wormholed into a place that I don't think mankind really wants to go, yet we're running there as quick as we can and striking out and angry at anyone that brings up the point, maybe this isn't a good thing for you to do. Maybe you need mm -hmm. to get back to one-on-one -on -one communication and dealing with your friends in the flesh and being in contact with people and not following the trend of what you're being force-fed on these wireless gadgets 24 hours a day because it's all... Oh, how many times have you almost gotten run over by somebody... I mean, how many times have you almost gotten run over on the highway by somebody that is sitting there texting while they're driving because they just can't right. be away from it? Right. You know? It's, right. it's just... It, it's even further than an addiction. It, it's like... It, it's mind control. Well, it's emerging into our consciousness of the uh, the electronics. I mean, basically, right. you we know, coming, years, right. years ago, people used to talk about the coming New World Order and how everybody would be chipped. I would argue that there's no need to chip anybody. We did it to ourselves That's right. already. That's right. Mm -hmm. Don't put down our chip. And so it's but another... You, know you cannot... Go ahead, Doc. There's, a, there's an old saying... It's when your servant becomes your master. And yes. that's exactly what has happened because the electronics that we're supposed to amuse and make our lives more efficient because we could, you know, stay, you know, in touch and we could keep files more efficiently, you know, and more effortlessly so that we could just keep doing more and more work. Well, now it's become our master. Absolutely. It controls us. We don't control it anymore. And we do and, not and, and these young people, they don't believe it. They, they, they're not even aware of it. You know, I mean, the, their government has been taken over in a soft coup. Mm -hmm. And as long as they were on the Internet and they had their, you know, their, as long as they had their iPhones and, and, and could watch their, their Internet movies and everything else, that's all that, that made any difference to them. Their freedoms can be eroded as long as they have their electronic escape. It, it, it's an amazing situation. And it's going to uh, really get problematic because we don't know what's being downloaded into everyone's head. As long as you're connected to a wireless uh, gadget, unless you have something like that 
on you personally all day long and are using it, you also do not know what might be being downloaded into your brain and you're not even aware of it. And no, everybody thinks I'm crazy when I say that. It's not crazy. And well, no, not with the advent of MK Ultra and all the you know CIA programs, you know, and, and what the right. uh, the Soviets were doing years ago by being able to actually pinpoint you know microwaves, you know, into a building and and cause people to suffer mental aberrations in U.S. embassies and and uh, in some points even have hallucinations projected you know, into their mind, uh, you know, by an outside remote source, and then not to mention the fact that, that you can raise the human consciousness to such a level that you can have what's called remote viewing, mm -hmm. where, unfortunately, for only military purposes, they have a number of subjects that meditate and bring their mind to a certain level uh, to where they can actually, when they're given a problem to solve, like... You know, where are the hostages being held? Or what building are, you know, are these secret documents that we need to get? You know, and then these guys visualize, you know, uh, where this can be located and where our intelligence services can go to confiscate it or capture it or take it out, you know, with, with a surface to air missile. Um, and, you know, all of this has been going on for decades now, and it's culminating, you know, in our, a lot of the military applications seem to be culminating, you know, in civilian life, and there's going to be collateral damage because of it. Already is. Well, the interesting thing about that, and you brought up remote viewing, and by the way, I will be interviewing Courtney Brown next Saturday, what is that, the 10th of September, on video, so... Uh, for those of you out there, stay tuned to the website. Courtney's going to update us. But the remote viewing thing was a sequestered government program from the 1970s. Now, they developed it for intelligence purposes, but they have a problem. Because if you go talk to the, the natives, if you go talk to the shaman, they laugh and they go, well, you need a program to do that? You see, one of the great mm -hmm. lies that's been right. told is that this, these people were special. Well, in fact, our human abilities to, to operate in that realm of consciousness were born into us and, in fact, I believe, bred out of us. And some of us are beginning to reclaim this, and I think this is actually what they fear. Well, it's actually pretty dangerous when it has to be extracted for military purposes. That's the unfortunate you know, uh, realm, uh, is, as a matter of fact here, uh, I think Ingo Swan, Ingo one of the, uh, yeah, one of the original MK, um, MK ultra operatives just died here recently. Yes. Uh, he was the luminary, the, the, the whistleblower that made a lot of people aware of what was going on and what the actual, uh, objectives were that they wanted to attain, you know, using MK ultra, but, uh, I'll tell you quite truthfully, uh, in the underground bases that we've got, the DUMS, the deep underground military bases that are located all over the U.S., the USSR, uh, Britain, uh, supposedly a giant underground base in China. Uh, they're using MK Ultra, uh, initiatives or protocols, you know, to, to control the people that are working underground to suppress phobias that they might get from being underground for long, long periods of time and to also keep them from divulging what they know to the public so that all this remains, you know, under the veneer of being impossible, scom uh, com conspiratory, uh, can't give any credibility to it, yet the stories are emerging and it has taken decades for the truth to get out. Have you had any communication personally with, with whistleblowers that have come out of any of these programs, Doc? Um, well... That you can talk about? I, I, you might want to say I'm not really at liberty to, to, to divulge. You know, I, I mean, I, I couldn't... I would never reveal, you know, uh, anybody personally... No, no, that that's I not what I'm asking you about. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, I've talked to uh, a, a few, you know, ex-military people and uh, that I've met, and uh, it's pretty shocking what they told me. That, and uh, this starts from about anywhere from you know acquaintances I've had in the late seventies all the way forward, uh, you know, to um, UFO crash retrieval conferences that were being held in the mm-hmm. in the mid two thousands by the. Uh, by Robert Wood and uh, and his son um, in Las Vegas that my wife and I used to go to uh, to well we attended three of them mm-hmm. and uh, you know the you, you have your you know your ex military intelligence people and and other people that were involved in various aspects of uh, the Cold War and it's a real eye opener and uh, unfortunately the government doesn't always tell the truth to people whose lives are on the line but they are reassured that oh yeah you will survive but when people start putting you know the equation together and start putting a slide rule to it or start actually saying okay just tell me about how you know it is that I'm going to survive in the event that something like this happens and they find out that they're being lied to. And uh, I, you know, was raised as a kid, you know, uh, George Washington, Valley Forge, you know, we're the, you know, we're the beacon of light in the world and everything else. And uh, sadly, there is a shadow government operating um, apparently behind the facade that we look at, at the, on the White House. And those people don't have our best interests you know, in mind, and uh, these black projects are probably funded in the trillions. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's it's, if if that those numbers are even meaningful anymore, because it it, it gets so staggering that you just keep intact, keep tacking zeros on the numbers, and it's kind of like don't tell President Obama what comes after billions because that'll be the next budget. Oh, that's right, that was the next budget. (laughs) Oh, oh, that's right. There's a debt ceiling coming up, isn't there? Yes, yes. Oh, got to blow through that one. I I can't stop spending money. Well, we're, that, this yeah. is a problem. We we have an addiction to this because we've become a nation of I hate to say it, parasites. Um, every everybody sucks off the tit of government. Pardon my indelicacy mm-hmm. here, but I know a nice way to say this, and it does come into the subjects we're talking about because the way they control us is through our money. And they've controlled our consciousness through our money, through the ridiculous system of advertising, entertainment, on, entertainment, advertising on TV, contouring our thinking by what we watch on that on the screen in front of us, rather than us going out and training ourselves as we should, uh, specifically. And I'm, I'm talking about going out into nature and becoming plugged into the earth again rather than this electronic mind control grid that they've built for us. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all connected. And the reason I ask you about, um, you know, and I was not looking for you to disclose names or anything, is you know these people, you know what they go through. Even if they talk privately sometimes, they're going to be harassed. We've had whistleblowers, we've interviewed... Oh, here comes the evening. Oh, let me tell you. I mean, it's amazing how you know how these people can be eavesdropped. And uh, I, I got to tell you about this one circumstance, and it was pretty freaky. Uh, it was back in about 1989. I'd been invited to go to a uh, meeting where uh, there was a Unitarian church, and there was a former U.S. Air Force radar uh, officer who had seen something that he should have kept his mouth shut about, basically. He was stationed in Britain, and he was standing in a uh, radar facility. Uh, There was a lot of brass there. There was a huge radar screen he was observing, and there was a UFO sighting. And apparently it was, um, well, let's put it this way. Uh, Apparently it created a great deal of uh, concern, maybe even anger with the uh, with the brass that was there because basically they thought they had the situation under under control and they didn't. So anyway, he was sworn to an oath of secrecy after this sighting. And, uh, well, you know, being a young man and being stupid, you know, he went back to the barracks and 
either he told a friend or a girlfriend about what had happened. Well, he was called on the carpet within about two or three days, and he was dishonorably discharged. And it didn't stop there. Uh, he went back uh, uh, to air. Uh, he lived in the southwestern region of the U.S. And uh, walking across the street in a small Arizona town towards a retail strip that had a second floor to it, you know, uh, asphalt, you know, two lane or, you know, three lane, you know, uh, main street of a small town, a bullet strikes the pavement probably under under a foot away from him. And he has to go running across, springing across the street and seeking cover, you know, against one of the buildings. And then later on, within weeks of that particular experience, he's driving down a highway in the middle of the, the high desert of New Mexico. And out of nowhere, a high-speed uh, Lincoln Continental, completely black, comes up from behind him and starts trying to run him off the road to the point where he finally has to just throw his brakes on and pull over uh, off the shoulder uh, in, in order to keep from getting killed. And... Uh, he was convinced after that, and I'm sure he was absolutely paranoid after that, that the only way he was going to stay alive was to make, was to stay in the eye of the public and to give lectures and to talk about his experience and be on the lecture circuit so that as long as he was visible, uh, he might have been a target, but they weren't going to take him out because then obviously it was going to draw too much attention to what had happened. And everybody was pretty spellbound, you know, hearing this testimony and everything. And, uh, you know, kind of, you know, you realize the darker side, you know, of, of the UFOs and when the government gets involved and then what starts to happen, you know, once you have this out of control, you know, uh, shadow technology and, and leadership, you know, that gets a hand in this. Well, it's 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 an amazing thing, you know. When I grew up on Long Island, and in the '60s, UFOs were seen all the time. So the natives of Long Island were accustomed to it, to the fact that it would be in our local newspapers all the time, and we thought nothing about it. However, when we contacted the military, I know it happened to my parents. When I had an incident happen to me. They called the military, and the military, the Air Force, came to my house and flat out threatened my parents that if they You're continued to really? talk about this, no, it was going to be a big problem. <laughs> and then wow. they went to my two little girlfriends that also had the same experience with me and threatened their parents. The parents got together and said, this is not worth somebody getting hurt. Just tell the kids not to talk about it. But, but then again, this isn't supposed to happen in a free society either, is it? No, not at all. And the three little girls, by the way, got no help, got no medical help, got no, um, you know, assistance that they, and no one to investigate the fact that they were taken and abused and physically harmed. That just was too bad. And that's the mm -hmm. way our society deals with it. If you took another little girl and took her someplace and abused her and everything, oh, it'd be a big deal. The cops would be there. They'd be investigating it. They'd be searching for the people. They'd be trying to protect her and the family. It doesn't happen to people in these types of incidents. You're on your own. That's true. Um, you know, uh, there's an interesting book that... Uh, Who is this? Uh, not it's not uh, uh, Jacobs. It's uh, it's the other guy who's an artist that uh, was one of the first people to start helping the abductees. Right. Bud Hopkins. Bud okay. Hopkins. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. His, right. Right. His right, last right. book before he died was called Sight Unseen, and I feel so sorry for Bud because he had just married, and uh, apparently he married a really bright, you know, uh, uh, attractive wife, you know, and uh, I, I think he. 
you know, he had some health problem that just started getting worse and worse. Uh, you know, you could see that there was some, there was a growth underneath his neck. Towards Coincidence, the end maybe? <laughs> yes, they were all, yeah, because look at Carla Turner. Yeah. Carla Turner died of, of, you know, she was an abductee uh, specialist, and she died of a strange, you know, form of uh, cancer. Uh, go back to Ivan T. Sanderson, the pioneer of USOs. He died of, of, of a fast-acting cancer. You know, some of this is just it's too coincidental. But anyway, getting back to Bud Hopkins, um, he found out that uh, a number of abductees go through this for decades and that there are what are called screening memories that are injected into their consciousness by the entities and where, uh, say, a person was abducted and they have a false memory that is placed there that is it's it's a it's a form of anxiety and it represents a vague event that the person can't really get their mind wrapped around mm -hmm. but they can't get through to what actually happened until they go through hypnotic regression and there was one well, that's, incident that's, where go ahead Doc, I just have to interrupt you. That's why the group of abductees that I dealt with, which were very bright, highly educated people, absolutely refused to go near anyone that had the idea that they were going to hypnotize them. They would mm -hmm. not allow it because they were afraid. Well, I've been, I've, been in, I've been in regressive hypnosis before, and it is an important tool. But a lot of people think, well, if you get hypnotized or whatever, you're going to lose control or somebody's going to make you do something you don't want to do or whatever because of these guys and, you know, that these entertainers on Las Vegas that say, when I not, when I tap my hand, my, my, you know, knuckles three times on this desk, you're going to have an un, uh, you're going to have an incredible urge to urinate, you know, and then, you know, everybody laughs because the poor person goes running out to the restroom or whatever. Uh, you know, people think that this is going to happen to them if they, if they go through a regression and, you no, know, it's, it's a scientific way of, of trying to get, you know, the mind to stop repressing and to actually open up and experience the source of the, fear and clarify what exactly happened because the human mind tends to use repression uh you know to denial uh you know uh to try to keep from dealing you know with the source of anxiety the terrible well that's experience not the reasons that, that they gave but i'll leave that for another time that has nothing to do with their uh not wanting it but you know, I guess mm -hmm. that's personal. My group of abductees would not even consider it. They felt that it was just the absolute most dangerous thing that you could do to them because there's no human alive that understands the technology or what was done to them. So the fact that some mere human with very little knowledge of what happened to these people went in there and tried to mess around where their memories have been suppressed or something else was put there if these people were fearful their brains would be wiped out or they would remember something horrible but far more worse than that they feared it would make them have another experience because well i i wouldn't trust an institutionalized uh, uh method i wouldn't trust an institutionalized effort. Uh, I would trust somebody like Bud Hopkins yeah, because so he had a lot of experience. I trust I, not one human on this but, earth. But you get here. people in a in a <laughs> like say in an institutional setting, you know, where it's a college or a university, and they've got DARPA money. Forget it. You know, I, I'm, I wouldn't let anybody. You know, uh, I, I wouldn't be subjected to it, and I and I wouldn't recommend anybody else get subjected to it. Can you yeah, share a I little bit that. about? your own experience with with hypnotic regression um since we got on the subject it would probably help to to round out the conversation a little bit okay um i had uh i was raising four kids by myself running my own business and uh you know just been through a lot of you know bad luck or you know making some bad personal decisions you know how they say the Road to hell is paved with good intentions, <laughs> and uh, I was I wanted to reevaluate my life, and uh, I had uh, 
just gotten blindsided, you know, with, uh, you know, by a fiance that I had fallen in love with in a, in a whirlwind romance. So I was going, geez, I need to stop this. You know, I need to change my life, you know, and just, you know, maybe going to church and saying prayers or whatever, just, you know, it wasn't enough, you know? So, uh, this lady advertised, you know, that she had a, uh, she was from SMU, which is a very well-known university. And she had a degree in what was called Rohan Regressive Therapy. Mm -hmm. Then somebody suggested, you know, because I was, you know, I was around a lot of people involved in, you know, various areas of, uh, of, you know, uh, consciousness, you know, experimentation and stuff. So um, anyway, uh, this person said, I can regress you back to your experiences in your childhood. I can take you back to past lives. If you have reoccurring issues in your life, a lot of times this can be as a result of something you may have experienced in another lifetime. And uh, I, you know, I must admit that I've had some strange dreams and everything that, that may have indicated, you know, uh, you know, uh, former lifetimes. And uh, so anyway, I went through it. It was just uh, like a uh, kind of like hypnosis, where you know you relax, you get quiet, you do some mental exercises, you know, to become uh, more receptive to the experience and, and to get your mind at a certain level, you know, like at the meditative state, you know, some people, it's not alpha, it's actually the beta level. And um, then the person just quietly kind of leads you through, you know, uh, you know, uh, questions about what you want to explore, you know, you make an agreement about what it is that you're after, what you're trying to find out about. And uh, so I was trying to come, you know, into contact with my spiritual guides, um, you know, my uh, what influences had caused me to arrive at the place that I was in my life at that time, and what could I do, you know, to, to improve the quality of my life and not keep making self-defeating decisions. And I've, you know, like I was told that this lady said, you know, I've known some people that, I mean, they go into, you know, sometimes not hysterics, but they get extremely upset because they experienced a, a trauma from another lifetime. And it has affected them in this life. Uh, I have, you know, met people that, you know, they, you know, for the fee that you're paying, I'm going to give you three two hour sessions and we're going to explore, you know, everything, you know, that could be affecting you that, w that could go back to, you know, our previous lifetimes. And you will also not only be able to identify your spiritual guides and maybe even the moment you were, you were born and what your spiritual relationship was with your mother, but also that, um, that uh, you would be able to identify the true love of your life or who it was that you were going to end up with, you know, as your soulmate. And so I thought, this is all intriguing. You know, I might, I might as well just give it a whirl because I was really thirsty, you know, to, to find answers, you know, and, and to improve my life. And especially when I had four children, you know, that were relying on their daddy, you know, uh, for everything that they had, you know, and, and certainly didn't want their dad to go off, you know, the, the deep end, you know, and I wasn't going to about to do that anyway, but you know, I, I, you know, was interested in improving the quality of my life. So, you know, I, I don't look at it personally from my experience as being anything that I was ever out of control. And, and in a sense, it uh, allowed me, I guess, to uh, envision some things that uh, I normally, normally probably wouldn't have been able to pinpoint without having guidance. Mm -hmm. Did you, as a result of the hypnotic regression, um, confirm what you already believed, or did you get new data that changed your perspective on, on your life or lives? I found out some things that I had suspected only, uh, I should have said, uh, that I had instinctive, you know, uh, suspicions about that, uh, that were confirmed, you know, um, and then there were things that maybe I had expectations for that were not realized. 
realized, I mean, you know, I, I really, really wanted to find love very, very, very badly, and I think I was searching so hard for it that if it had been in front of me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to see it. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever been in, in you know, in that, you know, uh, uh, mode, so to speak, where there's something that you want so bad, but you're so busy searching for it, it eludes you, you know? Well, I think so, everybody, uh, yeah. I think that was, yeah, I think I came to peace over a lot of things that uh, that were bothering me, um, but it didn't give me the ultimate answer, no. And I wouldn't suspect that anything external would. I guess what I was looking for is, I know there's different types of regression therapy. I know there's different people out there that practice it. And I think Chris expressed some concerns. I've had them as well. Is where you have somebody with an agenda. And there are some well-known people out there in the ufology world. And I would not consider Bud Hopkins to be one of them at all. Um but there are people out there that have an agenda. And I've seen oh, the results sure. of that where there is programming going on. And some of it is kind of turned in a way that makes me very suspicious. And so from that standpoint, it's it's kind of an individual choice of how we go about this. Um, from the standpoint of people who have experienced traumatic events and alien abductions and things like that, uh, and I know a number of these people... I think caution is the word simply because of the kind of ground that you're touching upon. In the case of people who were under um, mind control, I would I would absolutely say no. I, I it, th- th- that's a dangerous hole to go down given the level of intervention that's been done into people's minds, into their physical bodies, and the fact that you have alternate personalities that in many cases are, are programmed to kill. So you would want to think twice about that. So I th- that was kind of my concerns, right. and it was my interest on what um, you gleaned from that experience. Right, and I will tell you that I think this lady did have an agenda, but it did not affect me, but I was aware of what her agenda was. I believe that she was a, uh, she was a child abuse, uh, a sexual child abuse victim, mm-hmm. and that she tended to project that, as you know, like you know, Freudian, you know, uh, observations about anxiety, like everything must be, you know, the result of sexual repression. Right, right. You know, yeah. and in some cases Freud was probably right, in other cases he probably wasn't. Well, I think this applied to this woman. You know, that uh, I think she was making an honest effort, but unconsciously she had that agenda which was, you know, oh, there must be tons of people that are, you know, sexual abuse victims and they don't even know it because they're repressing it. You know, I I know that that was, you know, part of her agenda. So, you know, knowing that, she couldn't project it into me or make me believe it, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, But she was skilled enough and uh, was also... um, consciously committed to improving the quality of somebody's life that, you know, that didn't become a hindrance, but you knew it was there Mm -hmm. because sooner or later she touched on it, you know, and then I knew, I mean, even under, and I was deep under it in my third session, I was so deep under that um, it took her a while to get me out. You know, it was like being in a deep sleep, you know, you know, before I, you know, before she brought me out and I kind of wish she hadn't because that was my most lucid experience, you know, that I had at that one point, and uh, I didn't want to come out. I think that's what it was. I enjoyed being there so much. I didn't want to come out of it. I wasn't ready to, you know. But um, you know, so I think that you know everything that you experience in life, and and whatever it is, whatever tool you want to use to, you know, explore a way of. Uh, clarifying your understanding about life and what's going on and everything else, it's up to you, you know, to determine how it's going to affect you. We're not necessarily always victims. You right, know, we, right. we can't I have agree with that completely. Yeah, I resist okay? the uh, victim mentality as much as possible. Right. It's it's just a great excuse, and we got a whole nation of Full victims, of, you know, that are su- sucking off the the government's tit right now. Yeah, thank you, know? you. thank you. And, you know, so yeah, <laughs> yes, you know, I, I'm in total agreement with you on that. 
we're going to... You know, gonna, you said go something. Ahead, can I just say, yep. Doc, you were talking before in a conversation, and it's and, and something like went off. I thought, this is really horrible. Yes, we are becoming this nation of um, controlled, everybody, you know, sub subsidized off of the government. We're becoming this broken nation. We don't go out there and, you know, take care of ourselves or build a business anymore. We're just these things. And I used to think, well, that's going to stop because eventually everybody's going to be hurting and they're going to be so broken, you know, so poor that they're going to realize that this they'll is... They'll have a realization? Go. Exactly. You know what happened? Yeah, that they'll have an epiphany. Uh, right. right. But, but you know what? I, I, think, I don't think anybody would be capable of having an epiphany. You know, once they allow themselves to get like that, I, you know, I know that there's no, a certain no. rationale among, uh, you know, in government that, oh, well, if it gets bad enough, the people will finally wake up. Yeah, right. Mm. I, gave, I gave that up, and I'm going to tell you when. When they started giving out cell phones and things like that to the welfare people. Obama people's. phones. <laughs> he gave me a now, cell phone. I, oh, shit. That's when I gave up. So, in other words... They're not only going to drive them into non-functioning adults and, and, and a society that's not functioning at all. They're going to give them the tools to keep them under control. I, I, exactly. I gave up at that point. I gave up. Intentional so dumbing that down. Again. Yeah. Yep. At a and time of dumbing down. I keep them there. Yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. give someone a cell phone because they don't want to work. That it just doesn't do it. You know, there's no initiative for them to want to. Why would you want to work if you're given every single thing you need and controlled so that you can just sit? Yeah, but you see, what you're given keeps you in mediocrity. What you're given by the government keeps you in mediocrity. It does not open your mind. It does not make you a better person. You do not expand your con, your your awareness. You do not contribute to society. You only become another unit, a programmed unit. You well, have no individuality. Going. Individuality. You become mediocre, and that's what the government wants. At least that's what you know. And, people in the, in the leftist radical realm want. Well, the society better wake up, or else that's it. It won't be long. It won't be a hundred years. It won't be fifty years going to happen in our lifetime with that's what we're going right. to end up being a bunch of media yeah, Aldous, Aldous Huxley's brave new world yeah absolutely hey oh guys I need to call time here we're going to take a break yes, um, I need you to okay. <laughs> um, hold on stay stay on the line and when we Jeez, come back, I gotta get a glass of wine. You man. got you got seven or eight <laughs> minutes here we're going to play some music um, but when we come back uh, 800 I, we come back I want to I talk Light 800 I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the modern era of ufology and specifically the Arkham, the Arcleted Mesa and what you think's been going on out in Dulce all these years. So if we can uh, oh, kind yeah. of turn the corner on that. We'll get one. ready for a wild ride, I'm telling you right now. We're ready to go. We'll do that when we come back on the okay. other side of Off Planet Radio Bye. Live. I'm Randy Moggins with Chris Holly, and my guest tonight is Doc Vega, and we will be back in about five to seven minutes, depending on how long the tunes are. We'll see you when we get back. This is Tony something you're listening to on Planet Radio.
gentlemen, my name is Matt Presty, producer of the Secret of Light series. I would like to invite you to attend the first annual Rosellian Science and Philosophy Conference in conjunction with the Center of the One Heart Homecoming Festival, September 7th and 8th, 2013, in Waynesboro, Virginia, at the former home and location of the University of Science and Philosophy. Several speakers will present on the power of love in action, the cosmology of Walter and Leo Russell. Don't miss this opportunity to attend a life-changing event. Get your lodging secured in Waynesboro, Virginia as soon as possible. Volunteer positions are available for those who wish to help. Call Richard at 1-800-741-1012. That's 1-800-741-1012. And visit thesecretoflight.org and oneheartcenter.org for more information. To donate to the event, visit theoracleinstitute.org. Special thanks to Randy Mougins of Off Planet Radio for sponsoring this infomercial. See you at Swananoa. As never before, environmental hazards, genetically modified foods, toxins in the earth and air, chemtrails, and escalating radiation levels. How do we get control? Thanks to the work of a team of researchers, we are pleased to announce a revolutionary natural technology that can help your body rebuild its original coating. RNA Drops is a complement formula based on the newly discovered iCell. RNA is the building block of DNA. These new DNA structures are the gateway to what is called ascension. Many users of the RNA Drops have discovered the benefits of a product as unique as their own biology, finding newfound well-being, peace of mind, and a sense of control over their destiny. Like me, they are enjoying a sense of empowerment within their own bodies and emotions. To get all the details on RNA Drops and to find out how you can obtain a free mini bottle. Go to rnagenesis.com. That's rnagenesis.com. You are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.net and offplanetradio.com. Welcome to another dimension, a dimension of insight, a dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits, there are no boundaries. This is all Planet Radio. Hour number two of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins with Chris Holly, and our guest tonight is Doc Vega. And uh, just a reminder: next week, Ken Pfeiffer will be back with World UFO Photos and News, and we're going to talk about sightings around the world. And uh, that should be that should be a pretty fun time. Ken came on the first time and uh, he kind of blew it out. He had a great time and he likes doing live radio, and uh, we like doing live radio too. Welcome back, Chris, and welcome back, Doc Vega. Thank you. So this hour um, we're going to cut to the chase because we want to talk about. I call it the modern era. I don't know where the distinctions go. But uh, you, you, you indicated something interesting to me, Doc, um, that you correspond occasionally with uh, Norio Hayakawa, who is somebody I interviewed yes. very early on in this uh, show. And um, Norio was one of the people that kind of tipped me over to some research that had been ongoing about what happens out in New Mexico in what's called the Arcoleta Mesa, also known as Dulce Base. And... Uh, I know you've researched this and done some writing on it, and I think it's a subject that, that is due its course. Well, you know, it's an ongoing mystery that has endured at least, well, we're talking about four decades of, of mysterious manifestations now. Anything from cattle mutilations to townspeople experiencing strange vibrations and, and sounds emanating from underground 
uh, and the local um, Yakaria Apaches reporting that the face of the Archulita Mesa literally opening up like an interdimensional porthole as a UFO passes into it. It's just, um, but there is a history of, you know, uh, of U.S. military involvement, of direct underground conflict and death and firefights with uh, entities. And then, uh, supposedly, a, a truce and arriving at a mutual agenda and cooperation with these entities at the same time. Um, leading many to some very, very grave speculations that there are genetic experiments going on that are part human, part alien, and even part intersplicing with uh, with animals, like uh, like you know the genetic material that has been removed from mutilated cattle. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on top of that, the government, you know, keeping, you know, a veil of secrecy around it and unfortunately even more when they have to resort to it. So there's an ongoing investigation, uh, that I'm going, well, that I'm going part of and, and participating in. And I, I have to say this about Norio Hayakawa. He was way ahead of the curve. Norio was, Norio was one of the pioneers. He was. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about 1988, and he already had a televised, you know, documentary about it, and nobody had any clue. And um, you know, him and his camera crew, and you know, I mean, are, are actually have to be accosted by the local police chief, you know, asking them, "What are you doing? What are you here for?" And there was a definite, you know, uh, atmosphere of, of uh, suppression involved, you know, because they did not want this attention in Dulce. They did not want it, and they knew what Norio, they already knew what Norio was looking for, and they didn't want him to find it. Uh, I've been with Norio, we've been in Albuquerque, we've been around Kirtland Air Base, Uh, we've, you know, we've done a little bit of trekking in in some of the sensitive areas, and, uh, you know, he's a, he's a courageous guy, um, he uh, does a good job of, of uh, correlating the information, and he and I were both very much in agreement that it is just part of the human consciousness experience that people do not connect the dots. They just don't... When, when you have a number of suspicious activities going on or events that have happened and transpired in rapid fire sequence that all point to one conclusion a lot of people just won't connect the dots and it's it's denial it's fear government conditioning uh you know and and i called it the coincidence you know that nobody wants to admit to and norio agreed he said you're right he goes, you know, people don't want to pull these coincidences together. They just want to let them occur as isolated incidences. And when you do that, you start to ignore the body of the evidence if you're going to do investigation. You know, and, uh, you know, he was expressing a lot of um, regret over the death here recently of uh, Gabe Valdez who for 21 or more years had, you know, uh, conducted investigations into the Dulce um, cattle mutilations. You know, he was a a highway uh, patrol uh, guy that was, Mm -hmm. this was his, you know, area of responsibility, and he conducted forensics, you know, uh, uh, site, you know, evidence gathering, and... um, you know, he, he was keeping his own files and his own records. And when he died, he left that with his family. And at the time that I met uh, Norio here uh, in person after corresponding with him for some time, a few months back, Norio was rather perplexed. You know, he was going, man, I don't know if this, if you know, Gabe's family is going to 
just, you know, out of fear or out of intimidation, if they're, you know, just going to let this lie, they're just going to let sleeping dogs lie, or if they're going to, you know, take this evidence that their beloved, you know, father and grandfather had collected, and they're going to do something with it. Well, quite luckily here, just a couple of weeks ago, or just a few weeks ago, um, the family did, uh, you know, release their father's uh, evidence and files in a, in a book form, and, um, you know, that was a big breakthrough, you know, on this deal. And anyway, uh, for once, you know, we've, we've got some people that had enough courage, you know, to, you know, to um, allow, you know, this information to be shared with the public instead of being, uh, you know, forced into uh, obscurity. Well, and rightfully so, mm -hmm. they would have been scared. How familiar are you with the story of Phil Schneider? Uh, oh, was the structural engineer. I, I wrote about Phil years ago. I yeah. mean... Yes, it's it's incredible what that guy went through, and you know, and I've told people what happened to him. The guy was dying of cancer, and he was killed professionally by assassins that tortured him. Yeah, he was garroted, right? Yes, and it's just like, why did they have to do this to a man that had already made you know public ex you know uh, lectures? And they knew he wasn't going to live too much longer, and they went ahead and they killed him with extreme prejudice. You know, it just goes to show you. I mean, that well, and, you and know, there are some secrets that just don't want to die. You well, know? And, and this is there are some people that don't want to let those secrets die. Dulcie is one of these secrets that's been oozing out. Now we're going back <clears throat> to the events that Phil Schneider relayed that occurred in 1979. For listeners right. who don't know, Schneider was a structural engineer who was involved in the building of the underground, the Dumbs, at Dulcie in the Arcoleta Mesa. And yeah, he, he was yeah, one he of the analyzed people. analyzed ge geological strata. Yeah. And he basically walked away with the story and apparently some physical evidence of a 1979 shoot off out between military military and and gray aliens under 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 the ground in the base. Yeah, there was a firefight. And so Schneider was eventually <clears throat> by all by all accounts taken out. I mean, there's no way to put it. He was as you said professionally murdered. And so the whistleblowers who would might might be motivated to come out and speak about Dulcie how, were, were silenced for years. How uh, Have you looked into Paul Benowitz and the story there as well, Doc? Do you know that when uh, Norio and I got together and he was telling me about Benowitz, he even took me by Benowitz's uh, uh, widow's uh, villa that she has on the outskirts of Albuquerque, close to the... Uh, the Kirtland Air Force Base property, <laughs> where Benowitz used to stand on top of his roof and record images of UFOs that were flitting about and hovering over Kirtland Air Base, and being a very good guy with a very you know incredible relationship you know with the Air Force, with his Thunder Labs you know the um, you know this. Uh, uh, nuclear calibration equipment, you know, that he was making for the Air Force. Um, they said, well, you know, we'd like to see those films that you've been taking of those objects. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, being the good guy that he was, he just turned them right over and said, well, here you go. And all of a sudden, his life slowly but surely became a living hell. And he eventually was, I believe, institutionalized, had a nervous breakdown, and the quality of his life rapidly, you know, um, deteriorated from that point. And still his poor widow is living in that house that they both shared, you know, still staring out, you know, at the Kirtland Air Base where her husband used to, you know, focus his, his attention, you know, on those evenings that he was filming, you know, those objects and uh, you know, he's got three sons that have taken over the, the Thunder Labs that will not make any public comments about the father and what he went through. 
And I understand from Norio that uh, they visit their mother, you know, on the weekends. And you know, he and I drove drove by there. I was just, I was very saddened, you know, thinking about, you know, uh, you know, what her life has turned into and losing her husband over these circumstances and everything, and yet still remaining there. I was very sad for that. Wasn't well, it very, very interesting how the people with the most compelling stories are discredited or murdered or usually discredited and murdered and how all of a sudden all the research dries up and I know there are several people out there um, and Anthony Sanchez is one of them who has been doing work exposing the the information at Dulce and uh, apparently a Anthony suffered horrible nerve damage as a result of something he encountered when he was up on the Mesa uh, uh, several years ago. He described it to me. Um, but it seems as though this is like the ultimate taboo subject. Why do you think that is? What do you think is going on under there? I pressed... Uh, mm, it looks like we lost... Looks like the whole line dropped. Nice. Isn't this amazing? We go to talk about Dulcie, and all of a sudden, the flipping phones die. Hmm, well, that's just way too much of a coincidence. So we'll stand by here, and um, hopefully we can get our callers back in. <laughs> um, yeah, this is the topic that they really don't want people to talk about or consider, because it is the 5,000-pound elephant sitting in the middle of the room in terms of uh, what's really going on. And they do not want people to un to know. Um, here we go. Come on back on. Another uh, ominous drop off. Oh yeah, I was just talking about this, um, and we're just doing it naked. I'm not even trying to mask this. We'll bring Chris in. There you are. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. And um, thanks to the NSA Thank guys you. who yes, felt sir. they needed to, to nuke our call. <laughs> well, luckily I'm still alive. Yeah, well, we'll just get calls whacked around here for the most part. Um, we're not quite big enough. But, to uh, you know, uh, Sanchez, uh, Norio, Norio and I were talking about that, and that's very unfortunate. You know, he lost his wife uh, during the course of the book, and yeah. Norio believed that, um, let's just say an intelligence, ele uh, an intelligence element within the government decided to go and maybe uh, take a... A stressed marriage, and uh, maybe add the uh, add a uh, how should I say it? Uh, an element of romance to it, and uh, you know, and, and uh, diverted his wife away from him. Oh. Yeah, the, this these are these are tragedies. Um, at the time that I interviewed, and you know what that is a you know uh, I mean you know as well as I do there is a complete history. Yeah. Of, you know, of, 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 you know, women are always used, you know, to seduce, seduce, you know, people that the government wants information from or, or to find out that they're a spy or to turn an intelligence agent, you know, uh, you know, around and, and bring him, you know, into the fold or to identify him and get rid of him or whatever, you know, um, you know, there's a long history of it. So what Sanchez went through is extremely unfortunate and tragic, you know, just to produce this incredible book that he came across with. <clears throat> when I interviewed Norio um, in 2010, <clears throat> UFO Highway was just, it was actually in pre-release. In fact, at that time, the book was in a PDF form, pre-publication that had been uploaded to a server in the event of, you know, the unthinkable. But Norio, at the time that I interviewed him, was being very guarded about what he would say, even regarding the phenomena of UFOs. Um, I actually was very frustrated with the interview because when I got Norio on, I thought this is one of the pioneers. He's he's going to be one of the one of the keys that can unlock some things, and he. He kind of well, did. Well, he's going to be in the NFL Hall of Fame for ufologists, let's put it that way. But what I got from him was that at the time, he was either fearful or he was not ready to disclose what he actually knew because the interview 
was frustratingly short on substance in terms of actually coming right out and saying this was a this was a, a, an alien insurgence into our civilization, if I can put it that way. So, well, uh, let me tell you, uh, let me tell you about Norio. Um, publicly, he likes to remain objective. Mm-hmm. But if you get him by yourself, like you know, I mean, I've. You know, uh, I've dined with him and, and spent, you know, a lot of time with him, and he's very pro, okay? And he just does not want to come across, I think, as being so pro-UFO that uh, it damages his, his reputation. He wants to remain uh, objective so that, you know, he is not, uh, so that he cannot be discredited. Um, but unfortunately, when you when you take yourself to the point of almost being on the edge of skepticism, you know, yet you're still saying, but I believe there's a scientific possibility here, then you almost put yourself on the same footing as debunkers, you know, only, you know, you're, you're just a little bit further to the right than the, the debunker is, you know? So... Uh, you know, I mean, I know from talking to him, you know, what his, you know, real views are and what his real beliefs are. And and actually, he's very courageous because for several years, he held the Dulce conferences right there in Dulce. Uh, right there in the lion's den. And I think that if somebody really, really viewed him as a threat and wanted to take him out, they had a perfect opportunity, you know, and God only knows. I mean, I hate to see anything like that happen to him. And what happened to Sanchez is just, you know, I, I don't know why they picked Sanchez, you know, and unless he really got, you know, uh, close to the, you know, inner sanctum. And maybe they just thought that, you know, that Norio wasn't doing as much damage. You know, that's the only way I can look at it. I kind of had the sense that Norio was actually going out of his way to make himself appear harmless, even with the reports of him being down at uh, several conferences and showing up and playing what amounted to basically a lounge act. And I have the suspicion that... That was kind of the mask that he put on to prevent himself from being taken so seriously as being seen a threat. On the other hand, you know, what happened with Anthony Sanchez uh, goes far beyond the most often. It's disturbing. Very disturbing. Because, you see, now we're in this period where um, everything has been messed with. Um, There isn't even the ability to do shows like this with people like that are nearly impossible. I mean, sadly, I can't get Mm -hmm. Anthony on my show because of political things that happened. And that's Mm -hmm. not personal between he and I. It has to do with certain filters between uh, people. But Right. and, and, And anybody that's listened to my show knows this. My problem is that on every level we have what is now lockdown rule in the alternative media to the point where um, we have to second guess both our own responses to things and the responses of people who come out as whistleblowers because they can turn on a dime now. And see, I think that is the real game that's being played now. Taking people out draws attention. It's kind of like why they won't do the Kennedy assassination again. I mean, they almost did it with Reagan. They're not going to do it again because it creates too much attention. It's far better now to Bill Clinton them than than to blow their head off. So we're kind of in this place now where, where whistleblowers and witnesses are discredited or they discredit themselves deliberately. Well, unfortunately, the low information voter, you know, the the, the typical mainstream, uh, you know, Joe that, uh, you know, always worried about his groceries and his rent, you know, and, uh, you know, whether his kid's doing good at school and what his next, you know, reality show or celebrity, uh, you know, uh, competition is going to be about, you know, so he can escape from, you know, all the stresses of life and, you know, having a few beers and watching the ball game on the weekends. I mean, this is what the government wants. I mean, you know, they they want 
the you know the um, obedient sheep, you know the ant worker. And uh, what better way to do that than to introduce socialism into a system to where you know the the government values the worker and tells everybody you're being a good worker ant. Just keep working. We're going to raise minimum wage for you. Just keep working. Don't think. Keep your head down. Well, Don't worry about what we're doing. We'll take care of you. Our culture and is way the, past uh, that. We're in. Our culture is yep. way past that because they've already imploded their own economy. You know, they're, they're, we're now at the place where I think these guys may have over overplayed their hand as they do many times. Um, socialism, well, we've been in one form of socialism slash fascism for a long time now. How did we well, get from yes, there to there? It's never been <laughs> it, it's never been as pervasive and blatant as it is now. Especially when you had a, 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 a president that came in and he said, I'm going to redistribute wealth. And people said, oh, well, that sounds good. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to show you what it means when I start legislating it. You know, then you wonder why we have an economy that's only growing at 1.7%. And we've got 50 million people on food stamps. And we've got an actual figure of unemployment that's more like 15%. You know, well, or, you, you know, know ultimately, whatever. Yeah, I, you know, ultimately, they they've been at this for a long time. I mean, you know, going back to the establishment of the Federal Reserve and and fiat currency. I mean, we've not exactly not been a free people for a long time. We gave up our power when we gave up our money because there is no money. And the truth of the matter is, even their fiat currency has now failed, as it did in two thousand eight. And they've got severe problems. Well, well, if they weren't floating the economy like they are right now by buying eighty billion dollars in in uh, treasury notes or, or you know uh, in treasury bonds right now, we would start seeing catastrophic inflation and devaluation of the currency. So we're floating artificially right now, and we'll be lucky if the U.S. dollar does not fall from being the world reserve currency. And, of course, it'll never be admitted by Obama and the government. It'll never be admitted by the U.S. media until one day the whole bottom falls out. And we are experiencing exactly what the Germans did after World War II when it would take a barrel full of marks to buy a loaf of bread. People don't... Re I, I lived in Germany in the 70s, and mm -hmm. Americans aren't aware of the fact that that was a country that... Nobody owned a house unless they were very rich. It's exactly where we're going. Everybody had to rent. Nobody owned a car. You had to walk. And you didn't right. accomplish that much in your life. That's exactly right. where we're heading. And it's not a good place right. to be. Yeah, there's and the middle class vaporizing, and you're just going to have poor people and the very, very rich. Right. Right. It's going to be the rich and the poor. And you are not going to right. own your own house. You're, and you're going to be lucky if you have a roof over your head and food in your belly. And if you're a nation of sitters, though, and you just want to sit through life and have that little bit handed to you so you can sit through life, and we don't have any builders left and doers, what do you... What, how can, right. You don't how have any innovators. You don't have any motivators. You don't have any Bill Gates left anymore. You don't have nope. any Steve Jobs. You don't have any Teslas. Nope. You know, you don't have any Henry Fords anymore. They're gone. You don't even have a little guy that can open up a laundromat and do well and support his family and own a house on it. It's all gone. Well, now you know what they're going to do. What I they're going to they're fixing to impose a forty percent income tax on small business. Um, I mean, that is just going to kill whatever's left of the inter of the entrepreneur in this country. Well, when entrepreneurs well, why, are why? outlaws, then only outlaws will be entrepreneurs anymore, so we'll, we'll just wind up being the mafia. Right. And like what's going on in Russia. Exact. Well, Russia is the perfect example of what this will look like. It, it, the po post-apocalyptic America will look like that, but it'll probably also look like uh, Road Warrior. Mm -hmm. Yes, and right. that's, yeah, it's and just a horrible. 
that living in Russia is not a good life unless you're filthy rich. And the filthy rich in Russia live well. They are come ruthless. to New York City. They come to New York, right. New York City and buy $25 million apartments just to have on, you know, the cake in case they happen to fly here for a weekend. The, the mm -hmm. world is really off kilter and out of tilt, but not enough of society is grasping it. They're just sitting there and believe saying, it or not, oh, that's okay. believe it or not, this all has a tie-in with Dulce. It all has a tie-in. Oh, I'm so glad you're going to make that connection for us, Doc. Go for it. <laughs> because it's going to blow your mind. And, uh, you know, I was reading it and, I mean, I'm I'm already very well aware of the hierarchy and the you know and the the Bilderbergs and the you know and, and the ones that yeah. own the Federal Reserve, the families that you know have basically held a financial monopoly for at least two or three centuries, and you know have you know there's a, just a hand-picked few families and individuals that are on top of the food chain on this in this world. And that they're going to dissolve the, you know, sovereignty of all nations, dissolve the borders. Why do you think, for instance, that, you know, uh, the federal government is fighting efforts of all the border states to protect our borders because of the of the of the uh, North American Union Agreement, where Mexico and America and Canada all become one, you know, and subject to the world order, you know, but. The Dulce thing, I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, uh, first of all, what blew my mind was that uh, they had what was called the Muroc Expedition, mm -hmm. according to, to Anthony Sanchez, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a Muroc airfield originated detachment of soldiers and engineers and aviators that were tasked with the mission of establishing an underground base under the aegis of a nuclear test facility where they were going to weaponize the results of the Manhattan Project. Uh. Now, they found a naturally occurring seven-level underground tunnel and in interconnected system of caverns in Dulce, and they said, wow, this close to Los Alamos and this far from, you know, any huge population center and this far from prying eyes, how perfect does it get? So they began, you know, their expedition of, of you know, man and material began to penetrate the top of the Archelita Mesa and into the subterranean enclosures. Uh, initially, what they found was uh, what appeared to be a natural cavern and, and tunnels until they started finding in their description. We're talking about 1940 terms. These soldiers and technicians looked, and they saw what they thought were huge radar screens against the walls. And what looked like typewriting machines connected to them by glass wiring, multicolored. And they said, my God, I don't know what this is, but that must be you know, the weirdest typewriter I ever saw and the biggest radar screen I've ever seen in my life. And then they touched them, you know, and it, they were flexible. And it was everything that we would call an LCD or an LED screen now, only even thinner and flexible and still resilient. And, you know, the commanding officer took a look at all this, and he's going my God, we're into something way over our heads. And so they went further into the caverns. And what they found was uh, the caverns now were lined with a thin granite-like paneling that finished the walls. And when one of the soldiers touched it, his glowing fingerprints were shown for several minutes after he touched it. So the soldiers, in curiosity, started writing their names with their fingers. The commanding officer says, don't touch that. Leave it alone. So they found this incredible um, instrumentality 
that comes from, I mean, they know this stuff surpasses the finest equipment that they've got right now, which is radar and, and, and you know, tele, uh, you know, uh, teleprompters, I think they had back then. Um, um, you know, I mean, it's better than anything they've got, you know, and these guys have seen it all, okay? And so, and then one of the soldiers says, this has got to be German. It's got to be German. But they had a realization as they as they walked through the tunnel. They said, man, this stuff's been around for hundreds of years. This isn't only better than anything we got now, but it's been around for hundreds of years. So they, they progressed further down this labyrinth, okay, of of well, you know, uh, apparently well-organized underground passages. And they started finding uh, Indian artifacts and Colt 45 guns and bullets and spears and arrows. Then they started finding bodies of Indians. They went further and they started finding bodies, childlike bodies with huge enlarged eyes and strange long arms, and hardly the the hint of a mouth or or, or or an auditory opening, and blast marks against the walls. In other words, there had been a firefight. There had been shooting. And then that's when the commanding officer said, stop right here. And he knew of a guy that was a archaeologist and an anthropologist, and had forensic forensics experience. In two days, they airlifted him there, and from that point, uh, they began collecting the artifacts, cataloging them, containerizing them, preserving them, and the expedition went further, penetrating further and deeper down into the the caverns. <clears throat> Suddenly, they were aware that they were not alone the further they went down. And along the main caverns, there were there were side corridors that had been abandoned and weren't used. So here you have soldiers that are lugging equipment in, and they're packaging the artifacts and taking them out, and they're seeing figures in the dark and around corners. But they're not addressing it. They're not responding to it. They don't consider it to be a security threat, at least not yet. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is 1940, and this is the testimony of, let's just call him Colonel X, inter you know, interviewed by Anthony Sanchez. And, you know, if you want to say, well, this is all ambiguous and we can't, you know, prove it, or go back to the MJ-12 documents, Okay. Let me tell you something about the MJ-12 documents. All the document experts went on and they went, oh, this is a fake, this is a fabrication, there's no way these were actual documents. And Stanton Friedman started looking at all of them and he said, you know what? He said, I have looked at all types of historic memos and documents and files from the U.S. government dating back to the, the early 1940s. And he says, and these are the same ambiguities and the same inconsistencies in the same document numbers that don't add up as anything else that I have seen that is either considered to be historical and proven. And it's no different than these majestic 12 documents that were, that were mailed anonymously to William Moore, a U ufologist, that worked with Free uh, with Friedman back in 1985, and when I opened up the the FBI vault in uh, that was released in December 2010, which was an incredible collection of all these historical UFO investigative memos and documents, and I mean the stuff's hard to go through. It's hard to read because I mean we're talking about stuff that you know. Uh, was printed in teletypes back in the 40s, you know, and, and they did probably a lousy job of, of scanning and photocopying a lot of it, but it's still there, you know, and it's just, it's hard to work through, and I spent hours and hours and hours of going through those documents and reading them and then, uh, you know, correlating, you know, and, and summarizing them, you know, to, you know, and, um, 
the FBI took a look at the MJ-12 documents, you know, about 1987, 1988, and they resubmitted them to the Department of Defense, and they said, you have had an oversight. You have something here that was never intended to be declassified, and you let it out. Don't tell us, you know, that this isn't the real thing. Now, yeah, you're going to use your disinformation, you know, to debunk it, you know, to the general public. And they just basically threw it at him and said, this is your responsibility. You screwed this up. Okay. So getting back to Anthony Sanchez's um, interview of the colonel. Could we shoot holes through it and say, ah, you know, you, Anthony, you know, you just materialized this and, you know, you, you know, you created a straw man and all this. Let me tell you something. There's much to, uh, there's much too much knowledge of intimate, uh, command detail and, and different, uh, compartments and levels of intelligence involved in this information that you would have to know a hell of a lot to try to fake something like this. Doc, when you were talking about this before, you mentioned that they felt <clears throat> that this was an area where they were doing alien and human um, well, splicing or, or uh, genetic, hybrid, yeah, genetic right? um, experimentation. Um, okay, do you know why? This is the theory. They're saying that um, the alien race that pretty much created the greys, the little greys, who are servant robot, uh, not robots, they're biologically program programmed uh, entities. Uh, UFOB is the, is the uh, term that uh, early in the 1950s, Project Blue Book started using, which was... Uh, unidentified flying object biological entities, but they call them UFOBs. Right, EBC. Um, okay. They were engineered to serve their masters, and yet their masters realized that they had the ability to get out of control and to become too powerful. And apparently there was a fight between not only the greys and their masters, but also the inbred humans that were interbred with the master alien race because they were doing this to perpetuate their own progeny. They were a dying race, and they knew that if they did not combine with the positive DNA of a healthy and robust race, that they would cease to exist. So they had to attain, you know, a, how should I say it, an infused, you know, uh, existence, you know, infused, you know, with the, with the, with the biological, you know, uh, similarities of, of another race, a lesser race, one where, you know, they're, they would have all the dominant genetic, uh, Ability, but still would be dependent, you know, upon the other genetic superiority in order to remain viable and without becoming extinct. So we go back to Dulce and we go back to 1940, and this is all going on, and it's been going on for anywhere from 26,000 to a million years. Okay. Here comes that coal train. Uh oh. Andy's. <laughs> Yo, it's really loud. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. You're hearing it through the studio. I was it was some kind of a cue. Okay, we're gonna go into break <laughs> no, now no, with that last no, comment. I, I had muted out on the on the on the on the studio microphone. You guys are are on a separate channel, so you're hearing a, you're hearing the train. Yeah, that's the Burlington Northern coming down from the coal regions, heading off to deliver its load of uh, uh, combustible carbon materials somewhere. We don't know exactly where that goes. Yes, and you know that you know that horrible material that actually gives us the infrastructure to maintain our electrical grid, which uh, okay. will become 
destabilized here pretty soon. It's it's interesting, isn't it, that we're still burning coal all these all these years later. I got reports on the um, on the chat that our audio is cutting in and out for the last thirty minutes, which is you know uh, about concurrent with the time when our phone lines dropped the last time. The monitoring here in the studio for the stream is dead rock solid stable, and this is a brand new website that was maximized to do this. So, you why, can, why does this always happen when you start talking about UFOs? It happened when we started to, to talk about Dulce and hybridization yeah, just, because yeah. uh, I don't know, uh, they apparently have the ability to. Well, we know what they have the ability to do. That's what I said. The, the NSA. Well, let me tell you something really interesting, uh, Randy. We can go all the way back to Roswell in 1947, and they had a recombinant, a recombinant genetic scientist that was involved with that autopsy. And they have traced a history of his um, employment in a number of different bases and yet and then he just drops off the face of the earth and disappears so we know that even as far back as 1947 that the the powers that be were already addressing okay the de- the recumbent recumbent right, right. factor predating the um, official human genome DNA project and its implications yeah. Okay, so why, if you've got a weather balloon that supposedly everybody misidentified, and I think Jesse Marcel was an absolute hero, um, then why do we bring in a recumbent, you know, geneticist, you know, into the fold? You know, must have been some really special weather balloon. Uh, Doc. I think it was in the year 2003-2004, which is far away from Roswell and all of that, just to show you that this is just a continuing saga. In 2003 or 2004, I had a newspaper article when I was reading my local newspaper here about a body that was found on the shore of Plum Island, which is very close to Long I- end of Long Island. And mm-hmm. the body was of a man, and he was about six feet tall. He had a strange hole in the back of his head, and he had 18-inch long fingers. Well, Plum Island, we weren't surprised, the locals, they've been doing things like that for years with animals and there's been UFO sightings there forever. Uh, you know, the government would shoot at you if you went near the place, so forth and so on. But here we had a You think he could have been an obsessive compulsive fisherman? <laughs> <laughs> and they took the body and the police said, yeah, it's really, we don't know what's going on there. We never saw a human like that. And there were some other anomalies on his body that I didn't get. But it was well-known, it was in all the local newspapers, and the government, the the local police took the body and took it to wherever, the morgue, I guess, out there, and the government Mm -hmm. came in and took it, and that was it. We never heard about it or saw it again. Oh, for sure, yeah. this, this, This has been going on since probably the beginning of mankind, and they actually, um, I guess, got a good one out there, but... He had that hand problem, you know, when he's dragging a three feet long finger, <laughs> hands along with him. But these, this has been going on forever, in my opinion, and that's exactly. Well, can you imagine? I mean, if you caught that guy with his hands in the cookie jar, that has to be one big <laughs> cookie jar. <laughs> I just wouldn't want to shake hands with him at all. But um, <laughs> these bizarre things, and it was in all the newspapers. It wasn't hidden. But no well, that's great. Oh, I, I commend the newspapers. They they actually reported that. Yep, and the local police. That's incredible. Do it. Yep, but then it was just. Yeah, I'm sure the story didn't last very long, long, but I mean, at least nope. initially it got reported, right? Right, and then the local police admitted, well, the body was taken from us. We weren't able to autopsy it or anything. Mm-hmm. They came that in and men in black out. showed up, did they? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> hey, you know what? I can I just, guarantee you if that I happened in it. L.A. I can guarantee you if that happened in L.A., I doubt the story never would have even got released. Yeah, yeah. You well, know, like uh, you take a look at what happened to Andrew Breitbart and Mike and Michael Hastings. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, talking about a you know a forensics operation that'll hide anything from the government. There you go. And one of the abductees that I spent a lot of time with was a medical doctor. And this doctor told me that she believes that they are, and she doesn't know, she also feels it's a human-alien combined governmental thing working with them, and that we, they oh, let them take as many of us as they need to do what they're going to do, that's the agreement, and cover it up that they, she feels they're draining the people's adrenal glands and definitely it's all about biological um, material that they need that can no longer produce. Right, yeah, this, uh, this supposedly goes back to a uh, Eisenhower era negotiation that went on between Eisenhower's uh, administration. Right, right. And, and the aliens and, that basically came to them and they said, we'll, we'll do two things for you. Um, you give us what we want, and we will give you technology that will make you superior to any nation in the world. If and you resist, you we will make this proposition to another nation, and they will be the greatest nation in the world. Take your pick. So we allowed... Uh, now, this, there was a caveat in, uh, that Eisenhower made, and it was, we'll let you abduct, we'll let you mutilate you know, the, the animals... But we want the people returned to the place that you got them from. Well, so, that happens in a lot of the cases, but I think in some of the cases they just take them. But the, you know, yeah. I, I I don't know. I, I so you're pretty convinced. Where... You're pretty convinced of the story that Eisenhower did meet with ETs out at um, was it Andrews Air Force Base. Supposedly um, Holloman. Holloman, that's the one. Supposedly yeah. Holloman, yeah, in uh, New Mexico. The existence of an alleged treaty that was basically allowing them to exchange technology in exchange for um, uh, human, well, human bodies, basically, or human DNA. Yeah, I think well, well, Linda Moulton Howe kind of touched on that mm -hmm. with uh, Alien Harvest. Yeah. Which is really chilling, really, really chilling. You see, there's so many there's so many debunkers out there now. I mean, this goes against everything we talked about the first hour of last week's show with our guest then, who was a very nice guy, and but frankly was touting the company line. And I know that the listeners then were were kind of pissed off about that. So guys, we made it up to you this week because we went there. And people are entitled yeah, to their well, opinions. Yeah, well, let me tell you, I'm, I'm, I hate to say this, but I guess I'm more on the devil's advocate side. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't see any other explanation at this point of why this massive no. cover-up, why we have... Uh, I've, I've interviewed enough abductees at this point. Their stories are consistent. They're not delusional. They're very wounded people, and they're people who have stories much like we talked about tonight including um, some of my witnesses that told me directly they have been in underground bases and seen the genetic experiments that are there, everything from alien-human hybrids right. to human-animal hybrids, which is well, not new. Well, let me just say that this doctor also added that she came to this conclusion because of the diseases that the people, the, the, the abductees would develop afterwards would come from that type of abuse to the human body. And furthermore, felt that when it goes like in family lines or different, or there's like specific groups of people that seem to get targeted for this horror, you know, RH negative blood, different types of things, light haired, light blue eyes, all those kind of things, where you can't deny it when you talk to the people and they all fit in the same category, that they actually like farmed from the beginning of time these people to use for their biological needs. And I got to tell you, that to me is disgusting, and I think it's a possibility. So they take. Well, it, they you, you know, I mean, when you've got people that are, you know, they're talking about, uh, 
you know, finding scars on their bodies from uh, what apparently, you know, uh, medically you would describe as being a uh, a scoop, mm-hmm. you know, uh, yeah. taking implants. Right, you know, but uh, they'll do a scoop um, for a cancer test, uh, you know, for a, a, a tissue test. Sample. I forget what they call it. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, a sample. There's a medical term for it. I'm, it's escaping me right now. But anyway, you, you, you have people doing that, and you have the, uh, you know, people finding, you know, the, the, the foreign objects in their bodies. And when uh, this this uh, podiatrist, this uh, foot doctor who's been a ufologist for a long time, was on uh, the, the History Channel on a UFO uh, show, and he extracted... That would be you know, Dr. Roger Lear, right? Yeah. Roger Lear, there yeah. you go. I've met him personally. Um, and he removes this object, and it has a low... It emits a low-voltage signal. Okay, and yet it appears to be just a piece of foreign material. But you see, we are now arriving at this where they're going to start putting chips in people, and it won't be long before they start doing that. You know, let me, and, uh, you know, let, let, let me giving just... off these RSS transmissions. Mm-hmm. Let me tip the listeners. I'm going to be interviewing Jeff Harvey, who's a formal, former naval intelligence officer and electronics expert. On Saturday, and we'll release that the early part of next week. That's a private session, and he's going to talk about the chip that uh, Roger Lear had taken out of him. So we're still documenting this stuff. But I yeah, and Roger Lear, uh, you know, can't account for the ones that got stolen from him. You know, after well, that's actually what Mr. Harvey's going to yeah, um, and yeah, you know. they've been taking them. Uh, he basically has certain degree of. Autonomy, but unfortunately, no one does this research without money that comes from them. So, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, even our best research, researchers sometimes are a bit compromised. You know, um, I uh, have specialized, you know, in in the the more cryptic, you know, and the older and the classical UFO cases, and I'll tell you why. Because I believe right in the very beginning of this entire enigma that we already found the answers. And right now what we're doing, you know, in, in, in the era of the, of the years of, you know, 2000 and whatever, we're basically just recovering that ground, but we're doing it with better technology and with a different perspective. Uh, go to 1958 and Anthony Boas who was a South American guy that got abducted. I've heard about this and, before, yeah. Yes, and he said that, you know, first there was a landed craft, and he didn't know what the hell it was, and then he became, like, uh, disoriented, and he was guided into this craft, and there, and he said there was a what appeared to him to be a woman, but she was not a woman as we would think of, you know, uh, as a human woman, even though she had, she she was probably a hybrid, okay? And they 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 put some kind of an ointment or a cream on his skin, which was a transdermal hormone, which probably, you know, allowed him to become sexually aroused. Then he claims to have had sex with this entity, this 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 female entity. And she made sounds like a uh, like an animal, you know. Uh, he felt like during the whole time that you know of this intercourse he was having that uh, that you know she was making like sounds that were more like an animal than a person. And then you know he got finished. And Boy, it just makes you glad I'm not. It makes me glad. After, oh. Right, they were after obviously you know his, his ejaculate, you know his his DNA or whatever. But they they allowed him to do it, you know, in an intercourse fashion rather than extracting it, you know, uh, painfully with, uh, you know, the insertion of a needle. Yeah, or right. Yeah, but, but, which but, would be my choice. Yeah, that uh, would be mine, my, too. G, my DNA material, please let me enjoy it while yeah. I'm doing it, you know. Uh, it just makes me glad I, I'm not single and don't have to date anymore because I understand that they're out there. <laughs> 
That's, that's right. You know, you, oh, there's whole little, memes about this. You want to do now. a little bit of, you know, ex, <laughs> you know, you want to do a little background check on your next date, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you single guys out there, be careful. Um, make sure that the eyes slant in the right direction and look out for any telltale <laughs> signs of reptilian. We got about two minutes here, and then I'd like to wrap this up for tonight. Uh, it's really been a lot of fun talking to you, Doc, and. Um, can you tie up the loop on the political economic side and the Dulce thing real quick? Well, I, you know, uh, as far as Dulce is concerned, I think it is a, you know, the example of the government, you know, conducting, you know, a socioeconomic uh, cover up, you know, a, a shadow government, you know, uh, appropriation, you know, revenue, you know, collecting for, you know, what must be multi-trillion dollar expenditures that have to come out of the, you know, the, the government budget some way. So, you know, here with we have a government that is spending too much money, we're in a huge deficit, and maybe part of the reason the government refuses to actually... Um, make that deficit, you know, find a way to make the deficit balance itself is because of this black budget that is taking up so much of the government expenditures that they have to keep demanding more and more revenues from the public, whether it makes any sense to anybody or not. You know, other than that, nothing makes sense about, you know, government accounting and, and balancing the budget or anything. There seems to be such an obstruction by the government to balance the budget. Well, here's the problem. Part of it has got to be that damn black budget they're funding. You actually closed the loop perfectly. I I just had this conversation. I think I had it with my wife last night. Um, Do you recall the day before September 11th, 2001, when uh, then... Defense Secretary Rumsfeld appeared at a press conference to try and explain away the Pentagon's loss of tens of, I think, billions of dollars. Yes. That had oh, they just flat lost. What was it? They couldn't account for how many billions? Yeah, it was. It was. They it just was, lost it. It was enormous. So they, they they do what they always do. They did the disclosure, but then oh, son of a bitch, they had to blow up some buildings and put a put a bomb through the Pentagon. And I mean, it was just you know, it's so inconvenient. Well, you know, you can't spend truth. all that money without having some damn terrorists to kill. That's right. That's right. So you threaded that. God loop only perfectly. knows we got to you know get rid of a few civilians and you know that might be in the way. Yeah, so we, we just uh, that was that was beautiful. You closed that loop perfectly, um, Doc. Tell people your activities. Tell people where they can find you and a little bit about what you're up to these days. Well, uh, you know, uh, you can go to docvega dot com. There's my, you know, I've got three fictional novels that I wrote that all hint at every bit of this. Uh, even though I've got a uh, a supernatural uh, detective novel that, that hints at all of these issues. Uh, I've got a, a novel that uh, one's called The Ridge. Another one is called uh, in, uh, Incident on Crichton 1. And the third one is called uh, um, Demon in the Dark. Those are my three novels. And I'm actually going to contribute. I'm going to charitably give $3,000 worth of perfectly printed books to the USO, to our soldiers. Oh, that, that's wonderful. You know, I, I asked, I called the USO, I said, what can I do to help you guys? You know, do, do, do you guys like action novels? Do you like, you know, do they, and they said, man, they read that stuff up. They love that crap. And I said, well, I'm right down your alley, you know, so I'm going to be delivering, I mean, I mean, just wonderfully print, printed books to these people, you know, and to help our soldiers out. It's the least that I can do for them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. So, uh, that's wonderful. DocVega.com, yeah. and you can also be found over on UFO Digest where you have... Right, and I, I'm on Politicide. I'm on now public... Uh, open salon, our salon, uh, 12160.org, which is a conspiracy site. 
I have lots of publications, uh, you know, pick my, you know, my articles up, um, you know, and, and republish them. Uh, you know, I'd, uh, it'd be nice to make a little money at this. I make a little bit of money. Yeah, we keep much, saying you know? that too, don't we, Chris? <laughs> oh, jeez. Every yeah. day we talk about it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, pretty much banging my head against the wall for a, a number of years now, you know, just, uh, I think Sean Hannity once, you know, made reference to, you know, politicide a couple of times. And, uh, you know, there uh, I've gotten some recognition from, you know, some of the, you know, well-known speakers from, you know, a particular. Our uh, phone lines are fritzing out here. I think we are losing the system. So, um, well, it's been a fun evening. I don't know, is the stream still running, or how did everything just crash? Uh, we've got nuked. We've suffered through it. The recording will be up on the website as soon as possible. This has been Off Planet Radio uh, for July 31st, 2013, and uh, I think this game is over tonight. We will uh, we'll see you all again next week.